whatever you need to be challenged about some things in your life. Maybe you need some hope. Maybe you need a touch of healing from God. Maybe you need forgiveness. Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We need you. Holy Spirit, you are always welcome here. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing if you would. Anybody have a good week at camp? Oh, I'm envious of you guys, so glad you guys had a great week. We're going to look at Psalm 145, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 145, verses 1 through 3. We're in week uh, three of our study, Knowing God, and the goal is that every one of us would know God better and come into a deeper, stronger, higher relationship with Him. Ultimately, the type of relationship with God that would greatly impact many, many, many other people for Him. Psalm 145 this week, if you want a psalm to read over and over about the greatness of God, this is uh, one I recommend. We're going to look at just the first three verses right now. It says, I will extol you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. You may be seated. When I was a high school student, I worked at a restaurant nights and evenings. The cook on my shift was a crude, wild-eyed, very rough Vietnam veteran. He had a very hard life. He was a very broken, battered man. Very uh, biting in his sarcasm, his cynicism. But I really, I really liked him. His name was Ben. I was sitting with Ben, we had a break, it was a quiet night in the restaurant, we both took a break at the same time, and I was trying to talk to him about God, and I'll never forget him looking across that little break table and saying to me, now, this is how I think it is, kid, God's busy up there running the universe, there's a lot of stuff going on for him to keep up with, and I don't think he has a time or cares at all about what's going on in my miserable life. And when he said that, I had two emotions hit me at the same time. One was pity that this guy just had no clue as to who God really is. And the other emotion was anger. How can you have such a stupid idea of God? And I remember thinking, if you could just get your view of God right, your life would not be so messed up. Well, I want to tell you, all of us, we need to make sure our view of God is right so our lives aren't messed up as a result. There are two comments I want to make before we uh, dig in today. The first is this. We need God. Say that with me. We need God. If there's anything true about everyone you will ever meet, it is we need God. Everybody you will ever lock eyes with has the same need. They have a God-shaped hole in their life. And they will never find fulfillment until they allow God into that hole in their life. But they will never fully be fulfilled until they allow God into or until you allow God to fill the God-shaped hole in your life. It's not just enough to have met Him. You need, he's infinite. You need to keep going and growing in your relationship with Him and allow Him to fill the God-shaped hole in your life. The second thing I want to say is a quote from one of my favorite authors, a man named A.W. Tozer. He said, what comes to mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. What comes to mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. And then he goes on and he says, were we able to extract from any person a complete answer to the question, what comes to mind when you think about God, 
we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that person. What he's saying is this. The way you think about God is going to impact the direction of your life, the outcomes of your life, the future of your life. A lot of uh, you are at points where you're making big decisions. You're coming into important questions and situations. You're never going to know God's will if you don't know God. I, my life turned around when I began to realize God was a heck of a lot smarter than I am. And I would prefer to have him giving me direction than me trying to figure it out. I find that Christians rarely rise a view of, above their view of God. So, uh, one way to explain truth is to help you really understand the truth is to show you the opposite side. So, instead of talking about views of God, I'm going to start out talking about false views of God. And there are many of them. I'm going to give you four false views of God today. The first is the one my, ben, my friend Ben had in the restaurant when I was in high school, and that is that God is the man upstairs. God is the man upstairs. And his idea is that God is just a slightly bigger version of us. The universe has gotten away from him. It's too much to keep up with, and so he doesn't have time or interest in what's going on in your life. So I'd like you to... Um, I thought I would try to explain it to you, but it uh, might be easier just to show you, show you what I'm talking about when I talk about the man upstairs. Listen, that's the way it's going to be. You're going to do it because I said so, okay? Very good. Go away. What do you want? Can't you see I'm busy here? Huh? Am I God? Yes! I am God. Very simple. And you are not. Got it? What you are, you are a pest because I am busy. What? You got a pro... No, 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 no. Listen, I got work doing here, huh? Yeah, this is God. Uh-huh. Peter, Peter, well, it's about time you called me back. Yeah, you and that crew of angels, you're supposed to have that galaxy fixed by now. You're not done yet. What do you mean, angel problems? More money? More money? You tell those angels they ain't getting no more money. Oh, a union? What are they talking about forming a union? Listen up, Pete. You tell them, get back to work, or else there's going to be no union where I'm going to send them. You got it? Uh, ah! You still here, lady? Huh? Can't you see? Like I said, I'm busy. I got a whole universe going on up here. Ah! Boy, well, yeah, this is God. Yeah, the line's busy. It's always busy. Oh, this universe is old. You understand? It's full of problems, like you. Oh, crying. I hate crying. Stop crying! Look, if you're going to cry, you're going to just get hung up off. You still here, huh? Listen, lady, you got five seconds to tell me your problem. Ready? One, one thousand, two, one thousand. What? You broke up with your boyfriend. And now you're lonely. Give me a break! I got real problems up in here. I got, I got, I got financial issues, elections. I got hurricanes. I got tornadoes going on. I got people crying out, cancer, cancer, cancer. I got problems anywhere. Go away. Now, obviously, that's a bit exaggerated, but... It's also ridiculous. 
It's ridiculous to think that that is the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible is not the man upstairs, the God of the Bible. Let me give you the truth. The God of the Bible is much more than the man upstairs. He's more than the man upstairs. First thought, God is not a man. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, God is not a man. Does he speak and then it not happen? Does he promise and not fulfill it? When you think of God as just a bigger version of us, you do yourself and God a great disservice. Now, God uses human imagery to help us understand him because he's so beyond us. He calls himself a father, a king, uh, a shepherd to help us understand. But in his basic DNA, God is not a man. He is much more than a man. Second thought about this is that God is an infinite spirit. The DNA of God is that of an infinite spirit. John 4.24 says God is spirit. He's of a nature that is beyond us, wholly beyond us. He's in an entire different dimension. He's an invisible, infinite spirit. He's not bound to a body. He's not in one place at one time. God can be uh, speaking and working to us in this room and speaking and working uh, to the folks down the hall in, in the other auditorium. God is an infinite spirit. C, God is unlimited. Unlimited. I'm going to drop some theological terms on, on you right now. One is God is omnipresent. Omnipresent. That means he is not bound by space. We read in Psalm 145, God, great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. His greatness, no one can fathom. No one can figure it out. It is beyond understanding because he is beyond space. He is omnipresent. 1 Kings 8, 27, behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. God has never said, well, I can only be at one place at a time. That's not true of God. God can be here. God can be down the hall. God can be across town. God can be in New York City. God can be in China. God can be on the moon. God can be everywhere and anywhere he chooses to be all at the same time. Second uh, theological term for you. God is omnipotent. Omnipotent. That means God has all power. He's not bound by strength. It says in uh, Jeremiah 32, 17, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for God. God's never gone, well, gee, boy, that's tough. I don't think I can handle that. God has never uh, been uh, busy. He's never been tired. He's never been overwhelmed. He's never been stressed out. God is unlimited in terms of strength and unlimited in terms of power. Uh, God's never cried like that. He's never been, had somebody pick him up and carry him where he didn't want to go. God can, has uh, power to go wherever he wants to go. Last theological term I'm going to drop on you is God is omniscient. Omniscient. That means he's unlimited in terms of mental capacity. There's not one thing God does not know. God knows everything past, everything present, and everything future. God knows everything about you. God knows every thought you've ever thought. God knows every word you've ever said. God knows everything you've ever done. And that's true of everybody, past, present, and future. And he knows all of that right now at the same time. God is infinite. God is not a man. God is much more than the man upstairs. Now, when I talk to people, I often hear them giving me a second false view of God. And that is the idea that God used to be pretty good, but he's kind of uh, out of date now. Sometimes because churches don't always keep up with where, where culture is, people uh, view the traditions of church and view that as God as someone who's out of date and uh, out of touch, and he's old and worn out. And um, to help you understand that, 
Look at the screen. Well, there, there you are. <laughs> kind of snuck up on me, didn't you? <laughs> you, you rascal. Huh? What? A little louder. Yeah. Well, my name? Well, well, my name is, uh... My name is... G O D God God that's <laughs> I'm God <laughs> Yeah I almost forgot about that Yep yeah, I've been God a long time about thousands and thousands of years I have lots of practice being God Huh What Why this this is my throne Yeah right here it's pretty nifty, huh? Yeah, this baby, it rocks. Why, it's very entertaining. I, I've been entertaining myself on, on this throne for, for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, I used to be busy, real busy. In fact, I made the whole world six days. That was a busy week, I'll tell you. And then, then did I tell you about the time I flooded the whole world? Flooded all of it. Except this one guy, this fella, his name is uh, Noah. I had him build a big boat. Good man. He's a good builder. And he put all the animals on that one boat. Oh my, Whew. one stinky boat that was. But it all worked out. Yeah, but but not anymore. I'm just not too involved. You see, I, I get tired and I'm retired, I guess you'd say. I, the arthritis and, and my back and my hip and my knee and I just don't remember things the way I used to. I, I got it all started, but I'm not very involved down there anymore. It's kind of gotten beyond me, to be honest. The, the technology, them the hurts and bites and ram, sounds downright brutal to me. I just kind of sit back here and the angels, the angels come by just about every day, some of them. We eat cake, angel food cake, I'll tell you, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? You get that, angel, it's a fun, but it's good, it's very good. And uh, yeah, I mostly work on my, my crosswords and read my funnies. In fact, Where was I? Yes. Yes, yes. Right here. Number 13. You don't happen to know a three-letter word for a supreme being, do you? You know, a lot of people in practice, that's how they view God. As somebody who uh, just doesn't really know what's going on in life, in your life, right here, right now. He's out of date, he's worn out, he can't do anything. He used to do great miracles, he used to do powerful stuff, but God doesn't do that anymore. That's not true. Let me tell you who God really is. Number two, God is eternal and changeless. Eternal and changeless. A, God has existed forever. Psalm 102, verse 11 and 12, My days are like an evening shadow, man says. I wither away like grass. Verse 12, but you, O Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generation. God is eternal. God is, is of such that he's beyond space and time. 
God is an never and say this with me. Never ending present. Say it. Never ending present. God is a never ending present. God is exactly what God has always been. Eternity past, right this second, eternity future. He is eternal, changeless. He's existed forever. He will exist forever. Second, God has not changed. Psalm 102, verse 25 and following. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens of the work are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them and they will be discarded, but you remain the same and your years are, will never end. Look at me. God is perfect, the only perfect being in the universe. Therefore, he's the only being that doesn't need to change. We need to change. We need to become more like him. But God doesn't need to change. He is perfect. He is changeless. God's not one bit weaker than he was when he created the heavens and the earth. God's not, he hasn't forgotten things. God is not unable to keep up. God is eternal. God is changeless. God uh, doesn't look at computers and go, wow, I can't figure that out. He doesn't look at technology and go, right over my head. God's so far ahead of us. God is, is infinitely ahead of us. There's nothing he doesn't understand. You don't go to God and go, God, did you know? God already knows. He's already known. He's always already known. God is eternal and he is changeless. Third thing about God uh, as not a uh, worn out old man is he's active. He's very active. He's still active. It wasn't just that he was active when he created the earth. It wasn't that he was just active when he brought about the great flood. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that God works, and God is working all things together for good. God is active. Now, different parts of the planet, God is seemingly doing more than other parts of the planet because there are more people buying into who God really is. We can go to South America, and uh, you see God doing bigger things. We can go to parts of Asia, and you see God doing bigger things. We can go to parts of Africa and see God doing bigger things. Uh, somebody was talking today about how in pockets of the Muslim world, God is giving people dreams about Jesus, and they are coming to Christ. Whole villages coming to Christ. Incredible healings, incredible uh, deliverance. But he's still the same God in Grove City as he is in those other places. And he's not any different or less strong than he has always been. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a couple that had been coming to church. They have a daughter named Riley, a newborn who's had seizures and, and brain function difficulties, very, in and out of the hospital, in and out of the hospital. Two weeks ago, we prayed for that little girl. We anointed her with oil. A bunch of people came, and we just felt like asking God to go ahead and just heal her all the way. Monday, that was Sunday, uh, Monday evening, we get a text saying, took Riley to the doctor, uh, no seizures, brain function normal for the first time. Say, yay, God. That's here. That's in this church. That's, a, that's God being God. That's who he is. But when we have misconceptions about him, we don't get in on that stuff because we don't believe he can do it. We don't think he's still doing these things. We don't think our, our views of God are lesser than he really is. Well, let me give you a third one. This would be my view of God when I grew up in lots of ways because it was a reflection of, uh, my dad. They say the way you view your dad is often how you view God, and my dad tended to be a distracted dad. And maybe you view God as distracted and uh, caught up in his own thing and not you. So I want you to look quickly. I want you to see what God as a distracted dad looks like. Yes! Yes! Yeah, way to go, Bucks! Go, Buck! Go, Buck! Oh, 
O-H-I-O, go Bucks! Chelsea, how long have you been there, hon? Hmm. Since the beginning, huh? Well, what do you want, hon? No, I'm sorry. Daddy can't help you with your homework right now. This is Daddy's time to relax. Go Bucks! Throw the ball! Throw the ball! Throw yes! 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 What? Ref! He wasn't out of bounds! You're killing us! You're killing us! Those refs, oh, they're killing us! Uh-huh. Boyfriend. I'm gonna talk about your boyfriend. I didn't know you had a boyfriend. Honey, how long have you had a boyfriend? Six months? Huh. Go, 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 go! Oh, almost, almost! What's what's uh, what's the boyfriend's name? Ryan. Huh? I like that. <laughs> like Ryan Day, huh? Good, good, good. Go, go, go! No, no, no. I can't. I can't talk about your boyfriend now. Okay, honey. This is not the time to talk, Daddy's Time to relax. Daddy's time to watch the game. You know how it is. We'll talk later. Like, later, later. Yes! First and ten! First and ten! First and ten! Honey, honey, honey. Could, could you cry a little more quietly, please? Can you see I'm trying to watch the game, okay? Look, why don't you talk to your mother about this stuff? Uh, I am listening. I am listening. I can repeat back to you everything you just said. What did you say? You said you don't know what to do because you are pregnant. That's nice. Yes! Yes! Touchdown! Hang on, Sloopy! Sloopy, hang on! O-H-I-O! O-H-I-O! He's got a distracted dad. Not at all. This is Father's Day, and let's take a minute. Let's talk about who, who God really is, and God is lovingly attentive. God is a lovingly attentive father. Three things about this. God loves you. God loves you. First, uh, John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. God has, if, if God is infinite and he loves you, God loves you with an infinite love. If God is perfect and he loves you, he loves you with a perfect love. God, it's not like God doesn't have enough love for you. God has infinite amount of love for you and for anybody else. Because it's infinite and he loves you. Second, God cares about you. Psalm 103, 13, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God has compassion. God cares about you. It's not like God is, yeah, 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 he loves you, but he's, he's, he's preoccupied. God cares about what's going on in your life. He cares about what decisions you're making right now. He cares about what's going on in your family. God cares. God cares. Loves. Smile and turn at the person next to you and say, God loves you. Now tell him, but I think he might love me a little more. <laughs> you know, God doesn't love anybody more or less, but that third thing, God is near his hurting children. Psalm thirty-four, eighteen: The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those that are crushed in spirit. They asked him, a father of eight which child he loved the most. And he said, I love all of them the same. But the one that is hurting the most is the one that I'm thinking about the most. Some of you came in and you're hurting. You're broken. You're struggling. I want you to know God knows. God knows. And God cares, and God will draw close to you. How close is God? As close as you want him to be. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. God is loving and attentive and concerned about what's going on in your life. Last one. Now, look at me. 
This is the one that I would guess most people in this room struggle with. This is the one most church people struggle with. For much of my life, till I was a junior in high school, this was absolutely my view of God. This is how I did Christianity. Uh, it's called God in a Box. Hello. How are you? My name is God, and this is my little box. I know. Yes, I used to be much bigger and stronger. And then I used to roam all around and do all sorts of neat stuff. But then the church people, they put me in this little box. They told me, don't scare anybody. So here I am. Seems like every day that I'm in this box, I get smaller and smaller and weaker and weaker. But as long as I stay in the box, they say, everybody's happy. They're happy. Sundays, I get a bigger box, an entire church building. But at 12 o'clock noon, they always put me back in this little box. On Sundays, people like to sing songs about how big and strong I used to be. But then they put me back in the box. Except for a few. They take me home with them. They take me to work with them. They take me to school with them. I like them. I seem to be much bigger and stronger when I'm with them. When the church people have problems, then they want to get me out of the box. If somebody dies or somebody's sick, they get me out of the box and they want me to be big and strong just for them. But then they put me right back in this little box again. Oh well, maybe someday they will see all that I could do if they just let me out of the box all the time. I gotta go now. Sorry. Bye. Got in a box. Let me just to give you the truth real quick. God, the truth is God's unlimited. You can't put God in a box. A hey, God is too big for any box. God is unlimited and he's too big for your box. Having God in your box is a game you are playing in your mind that is far from reality. The God in the box is just something you're doing in your head. 1 Kings 7.27 says, But God, will God really dwell on the earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you, much less this temple I have built. Jeremiah 23.24 Can anyone hide in secret places so I can't see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Second thing I want to say is that God can do more than we can imagine. God is capable absolutely capable of doing far more than you can possibly imagine. I love Jeremiah 32, 17. O oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing. Nothing. It's not like you bring something to God and he goes, oh, gee, I, that's, whew, that's a tough one. Whoa. Never that way with God. Ephesians 3:20. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. God is almighty. He was almighty. He is almighty. He will always be almighty. Look, the challenge in your life, look at me. 
you will run into big, complicated, hard things. The challenge isn't how big is your problem. The challenge is how big is your God. And the answer is big enough. Now, like I said, this was my predominant view of God if you looked at the way I lived until I was about 17 years old. I had to go to church. I had gone to VBS. I had gone to camp. When I was a kid, kids were praying the prayer, and I prayed the prayer because I wanted to not go to hell. I wanted to be saved. I would go to camp and uh, think about getting God out of my box. I would feel guilty about having God in my box. But he's just a Sunday thing. He was just an occasional thing. He was just when I had a big problem thing. That's how I did my life. God was just one of many boxes in my life. I had a sports box and a school box and a, a hobbies box, art box, friends box, family box, relationships box, God box. Then I got to be about 15, and I realized this is kind of stupid, and I did not want to let God out of the box. God was working in some other kids' lives, and I'm like, I, what are people going to say about me? And I didn't want God to get out of my box because I knew I couldn't control God. I knew enough to know that if I let God out of the box, he might do things I didn't want done. He might lead me in directions I don't want to go. He might... Uh, uh, I couldn't control him. So I just kept him in the box all the time, including Sundays. But then I got really miserable, because that's not how life was meant to be lived. And eventually I saw people my age that had God out of the box, and I saw that they had what I really wanted. Went to a young adult slash student thing on a Sunday night. God was all over that meeting. God spoke to me so much, I felt like my heart, everybody would hear it pounding. I didn't want to make some sort of commitment that I couldn't keep. By the time I got home, I couldn't keep fighting any longer, and I said, enough. I got down on my knees. I said, God, they say that you would take my life if I would give it to you. Take my life right now, all of it. God, I'm tired of trying to keep you in a box. You get the whole enchilada. You get all the boxes. I can tell you, that was an amazing night. <laughs> and that was the most amazing decision. Because God started doing amazing things in me, and God started doing amazing things for me, and God started to do amazing things with me, things that I could not ask or imagine or even think. All this depression that made me suicidal for a year, this, this challenge with pornography that made me feel so guilty, This heart that felt like it was dead and dried up came alive. Instead of being so afraid of the future, I had somebody who was guiding me in the future. Look, I am super excited for everybody that went to camp and especially those that that recommitted to the fact that God's out of my box and I'm not keeping God in the box and God, you got free reign in my life. I'm super excited for you. I'm super excited for everybody that said, God, I'm tired of having you in a box. You got my life. You got free reign in my life. You lead me. You do what you want to do. But I want to challenge you. Don't get back into the God in the box thing. Not the way we were meant to live. 
I want to challenge all of us. I see three responses. One, a lot of us in this room ought to repent because we've done God a great disservice by having a false view of God. Look at me. Listen to me. If you've got a false view of God, that's just basically idolatry because you're worshiping something that is not the real thing. Repent. Second, make a decision. God out of the box all the time. All the time. Every day, everywhere, every place, every situation. I'm not trying to shove God in a box. Third thing, I told you God's a father that cares. He's a God that's mighty and has power. If you got a need, a big situation, love to pray for you. We're going to stand and worship, and uh, I'm going to pray first, then we're going to stand and worship. Maybe you want to come and just say, I need prayer. Pray for me, this situation in my life, my family. Pray for me. We will pray for you. Maybe you want to come and say, you know what? I, did, I don't care what anybody thinks. I am. I really mean business with this stuff. All in, all the time. Or maybe you're going to come and say, you know what, I remember living that way, and I, what was I thinking? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much that you're bigger than my box. Thank you that you're better than any dad. God, you're not tired, you're not worn out, you're not distracted, you're not busy. God, you're giving us your undivided attention right now in this room. God, how we thank you for that, how we praise you for that. God, may we respond to the God that you are appropriately in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship this great God.